The same once we get through the regular piece, right? They don't change, do they? You're right. 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 you are right 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 you are quickly um to welcome everybody to tonight's meeting the general board meeting will be quick call personnel meetings or personnel items and um we'll turn it over to president majeski uh welcome everybody they said we have the roll call thing that would be great if i remembered my roll call things so it's not necessarily going to be in order <laughs> drew hampton here Josh Hoagland? Here. Josh Majeski? Here. Reeve Majeski? Present. Cindy Brassington? Present. Tim Vogt? Here. Justin Rodriguez? Here. Tony Serafini? Greg Clevon? He's on. He's on. He's on. He's on. Greg, are you here? Oh, is he on? He was on, but then he got, he was. He left. Um, Tony's absent. Don't members present. So we have seven members present. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Please stand. Please. The region's spirit of honoring of the United States of America and to the all of the just to stand one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> Starting with the agenda hearing period. The purpose for the agenda hearing period is to permit residents in the audience to make a statement to the board of directors on action items on the agenda. At this time, we'll accept comment from district residents and property owners on action items on the agenda in person or via Microsoft forums. You can find the form on the website, the Facebook page, or board docs. Um, are there any in-person agenda hearing period comments? Mr. Davis, are there any online agenda hearing period comments? This is Majeski, there's nothing online. Yeah, we just uh, quick. We did have an executive session last week. Um, the personnel and our student discipline matters. But it would have been Tuesday the sixth. And one tonight. And then we'll have an executive session this evening. We had one just already tonight. Prior, and we're going to have one after. Short one after. Yeah. Prior to the meeting, we had an executive session, and we will have a brief one after. regarding personnel. After meeting. Just a quick, quick couple. Is Greg off or on? You know, he was just on. Mr. Becker, he, Mr. Claiborne is not listed as a person in the meeting right now. Perfect. Are you set, Mr. Becker? Are you done? Yep. All right, moving on to items personnel. Um, Chair is looking for a motion to approve items personnel, and we can do a through N and P, since Greg is here as a block, if you guys are okay with that. So moved. Motion by Tim. Second. Second by Josh Majeski. Any discussion? Congratulations to all of our candidates. Discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Congratulations. Uh, moving on to board comments. Thank you to everybody who made the end of the year fun and successful and to all the hard work of facilities to wrap up the year and get ready for the next year in 70 short days. Um, hope everybody has a safe and fun summer. Any other board comments? Congratulations to the class of 2023. Graduation went well. Back up to the university. Very nice um, celebrating the class of 2023. Yes. 
moving on to recognition of the public. At this time, we'll accept comments from district residents or property owners in person or via Microsoft Forms. If you're a resident or property owner and are not physically present at the meeting, I would like to make a comment. You can access the public comment form on the link in board docs, the Facebook page, or the website. Any in-person comments? Mm -hmm. Mr. Davis, any online comments? Sure. This is Majeski. I do not have any online comments. Okay, Chair is looking for a motion to adjourn. So Second. Motion by Drew, second by Josh Hoagland. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 This is a record. That is a record. Welcome to Southern Plum. Thank you. Yes. Can we roll right into facilities finance? Yes. 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 Yeah. We're okay. Yeah. Um, where are you going, Bob? What do you mean we're not going? That's it. Do facilities meeting? Where are you going? Why? All right. I woke up. Congratulations. All right. Congratulations. You guys came for five minutes. I told them. You might as well stay on the second. Facilities and finance will be the runaway. If you would like to stay at the special. It's all going to finish. I'll sign in. I'll see you send the little one. I have like three of my thoughts. Yeah, I'll be here. Nowhere else I'd rather be. Back in my son was right to a facility update. Go ahead, Scott. All right, good evening, everybody. Um, so I knew I ran first up, fuel pumps were the I were going home. The cats were hungry. I should. They're younger than my kids. So the diesel sump was fixed. It was inspected by L and I, and we uh, got our permit last week. So we're we're good to go with that one. Um, on another note, on this, I'm going to well, I'm looking into having that come. Um, every year, these things have to be inspected right here. And Greg, Hi, Greg. Oh, Greg. <laughs> well, Greg, I'm basically trying to communicate with you, but thank you very much. <laughs> Too late. Sorry. Now again. Uh, the rain slowed down me while jogged the night. <laughs> so every year these things have to be inspected by a licensed inspector, and then a big inspection every three years. So I'm looking into having BNF give us a price on on getting them done. Um, elementary bathrooms um, downstairs in the elementary uh, fourth grade area. Um, there's three sets of bathroom exactly the same. Uh, we got a price where we're, we're going to put some uh, some new partitions, higher ones in there uh, for the fourth grade um, area. Can you define higher? They are 70, 76 inches. Is there any reason to stop short of the ceiling while we're doing it? Well, for one thing, the lights are in the way, so all the lights would have to be moved. Um, so they're going to be, if I'm not mistaken, no, I'm, I'm wrong, I'm sorry. They're going to be like four or five inches off the floor. Then there's going to be a short panel, I think, of two feet, and then a 72-inch one. So they're going to be well over, I think, well over six feet. So yeah. um, the company that was here didn't recommend going up to the ceiling um, because of moving all the light fixtures and stuff. And they they recommend, especially for cleaning purposes, to keep them up a little bit and for airflow. You don't want to. But we did address our concerns with uh, viewing areas and connecting areas, both physically and visual. And they said this is what they're putting in many schools for the same concerns. They were very, they, they went through many options. I really, the hinges were really important to me. Can you explain the hinges? Yeah, they're, they're solid hinges. 
that you can't see through. And then when the closure is, it's almost like a ship lap that you can't see through them either. There's no gaps. So, no gaps. Yeah, no that's gaps. That's really important to us. I think that's important to everybody. Yeah. So they will, uh, the materials ordered. So as soon as that comes in, they'll schedule to come and install them. So, and I guess along that lines too, we are looking at, we have material in some of the other bathrooms. We're gonna put partitions are like, yeah, partitions between the urinal um, with the stuff that he had, me and my maintenance crew will do that. Are you doing whatever partitions are coming out of those bathrooms to make way for these? Or could we potentially reuse that to raise the other ones as well? The, the ones that are coming out, the ones that are coming out are shot. They're old metal ones, they're all rusted. Gotcha. Yeah, original. Yeah, they're second. original. Okay. Yeah. So. As, as, we, as we have to try to renovate other bathrooms, we'll probably just get new partitions. Again, um, as high as we can go, closing the gaps, that type of thing. They were things we were looking for. Well, is this the only place that, that does this type of work? Is it the only place? Yeah. I'm just curious. I'm, I'm sure there's other outfits out there. Um, the, this company, this AG Moral, they have done a lot of work here for us. Um, their prices has always come in um, under everybody else. They're a co-star vendor. They're a co-star right. vendor. Um, Which guarantees they've they're, been, they're already bid. But you can't, you can't find a cheaper price inside the network. They will match, they've already matched the price of the network. So that's CoStars, um, Pepham, and KPM. KPM. Those are the three in the state that you can use. Okay. CoStars is probably the biggest for materials. Right. Pepham is technology, and KPM is typically supplies, paper, pens, art. But then we use all three here. It's just an eye opening. Well, that's why. You know, and actually, when we were pricing out the materials, Scott, we were, we were edging to. When I priced out the materials for us to do it. For us to do it, I think the materials alone came to almost $20,000. With, with no labor <laughs> and now with no labor yeah yeah i was right i mean yes i think it is a little sticker shock but when we went and looked it up ourselves, yeah. i was it's, like it's double sticker shock it's yeah sticker shock it was yeah it, it was a sticker shock when we built the bathrooms down at the stadium yeah we did like 400 pounds yeah we agreed yeah. it's like yeah because yeah. there's all those compliance rules and Handicap accessible ADA, things like that. Well, and anybody that's doing any projects, I mean, building materials are are up. So, anything else on that? Do we have anything on that? All right. Uh, summer cleaning has begun. Here. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's it's going to be tough. I mean, it's it's going to be. But you know, I mean, I, I trust my custodians. Um, they they do a good job every year, and we always. We always get them done, so um, we're just keeping our fingers crossed. So some summer projects we have going on this year. Um, we have some classroom movement. Um, I don't know if any of you is sixth grade and seventh grade are changing places uh, in the middle school. Um, now the teachers were great. They did a lot of their moving before they before they left for the summer break. Um, they did a lot of moving, but they didn't put anything away. So. You know, we got to work around that. And then I think just the, the elementary has a couple of movements. I don't think there's many over there. Two. Two or so. Um, rewiring high school classroom speakers. I'll let Chris, or, uh, Chris talk about this. I... So we have a uh, concern with the balancing of the, the classroom speakers in the high school versus the classroom speakers in the middle school. They're on the same PA address system. The speakers in the high school were wired at the wrong wattage. So when you come through and you talk at say a normal volume, it's blaring in a high school classroom and it's kind of kind of bearable in a middle school classroom. So by by basically taking, I forget the colors, but Scott and I know the colors, it's the black, it's like red. And you just have to take the black off and put the red on. That lowers the volume, amperage, fancy words they didn't know, and uh, and then it makes them correct. So the company that we're working with that we've been with for a while they did the middle school and they say the middle school is correct they don't know who did the high school because it was done long ago so they said for whatever reason it wasn't balanced so if you're talking at a normal volume high school is great 
those are not so great. If you're talking in a loud volume, which a lot of people do on the PA system, they speak a little extra loud. It's really loud in the high school classrooms and, and good in the middle school. So this goal is just rebalance it and make it be proper. The hallways are all correct. Um, the hallways are good. It's the high school classroom. You're, so. you're saying you just have to do something at the speaker? At the, each speaker, you pull, okay. pull the panel off, you're not, undo you're a wire not nut. New wires or anything. No new wires. You're, you're just simply swap. switching. Okay. Each speaker has four levels, and they're set. the high school classrooms are set at the highest level. They should be set at the second highest level. So it's simply a, a, somebody made a mistake at some point. And it might not even have been truly a mistake. When they added the middle school wing, I don't know that anybody thought of it. And since I've been here and we've been working on all the different things you guys have been saying, security, right, um, communication, we've noticed that some of the classrooms, they literally had cardboard taped over their speakers. Well, my first question is why? Well, it's too loud. So I called the company and they said, okay. And they came, they said, well, it's miswired. So I said, well, just check the next three classrooms. And they were all miswired. So then obviously, and then they said, here's the nice thing too. I like it when a company says this to us. They said, we'll show you how to do it. And your people can do it. Saves you money. So like, I, I respect somebody that says that to us. You know, They said, we're really slammed. We can't get you until the end of summer anyways. Why don't you take care of it? I was like, I like that. You know, so Money-wise, I think that's a good, good relationship. Mm -hmm. are, there, are there other things that are fixed with cardboard or stuff that we don't know about, like just random? Well, I keep my eyes on you. So when, yeah. Jim and I took a big walk about today looking at things like that. So we, we're that, fine. I, I just, from my end, you know, living with known problems right culture of living with known problems um why why would they not report something like that or did had they before and just nothing was done about it or they assume nothing would be done so we'll just fix it ourselves with cardboard or i think unfortunately when i was talking with some folks they suggested that they didn't feel comfortable informing the problem to certain individuals they didn't okay. they knew there was scott's oh, like... mean <laughs> it didn't yeah. say Scott. Oh. There's in some classrooms there's volume control, and so that was that was you know part of it. But it's so many older places in the high school that weren't, um, you know. It, and we, you know, of course we say, well, there's, you know, there's old, it's an older system, you know, connected to a newer system, you know, that type of thing. But it's the first time we had. This company actually yeah yeah no, I, I, I get the uh, you know what I'll say like, how this came, question is I know I get your question around the uh, so Jim's message is see something say something yeah. that's where this came about somebody came to me and said Chris we did a lockdown drill and I couldn't hear a thing and I said oh my let's fix that and in this process of starting that yeah repair Start we determined like five other problems and then people well, then my favorite one is not that anybody admitted to this but somebody like the company showed me somebody cut the wires. So I kind of started asking around. They said, well, you know, if it's too loud, you just cut the wires. I said, never, ever cut wires again. <laughs> I'm not going to blame anybody here. But so we so we did have to pay that, that one rewired because they were physically cut on the device. Um, that's not a good solution. And um, the other solution we identified, too, was was all calling. Um, although I, I mean, I've been here a short time and I know how to all call. We need some training. I, I would almost call it phone etiquette. But back to your question, I think the true answer here is that people are – Taking ownership of see something, say something, because okay. we're getting more and more reports of Good. concerns, especially related to safety and security, um, not propping doors, um, not letting people ghost in, you know, closing doors and not letting someone follow you in. Um, I know the other week, right before the end of school, there was a kid and he, he was deciding whether or not to let an adult in. I kind of was um, fly on the wall, so to speak, and the kid pointed the adult to the office through the glass. And then the adult walked over to the glass. And I went over to that kid and I said, exactly. Yes, they look like they belong here. Shirt and tie. Don't let them in. And the kid goes, yeah, I was really debating. And I said, well, I'm glad you thought about it and you made the right call. And I think um, thanking that child, I think, will have an impact for us for many. It was a middle school kid. So kudos to that middle school kid. Because I, I got to tell you, when I walk around the building, kids will pop the door for me. Now, some of them know me, but not many of them. So like, just because I look, but they shouldn't do that. I have a fob, I can fob in. So I always say to the kids, thank you, but please don't do that again. <laughs> so I think see something, say something that Jim has been promoting is working. Okay. But I think it's going to take some time to change the culture. Okay. Does that help? Yeah, that answers my question. Okay, thank you. Stick your doors. I'm 
Yes. Yeah, not exterior doors. Uh, exterior door replacement needs. Um, the two exterior boiler room doors. Um, NRG came in and wired them, and they're having issues with the hardware on them, trying to find the hardware to make them work with a fob system because um, they're old. I, they're, they're original doors. It's original hardware when the buildings were built. So um, the same company, AG Morrow, has done a lot of doors. In the, so while they were here, they're working up some prices to replace the, the to replace the hardware on them doors. So not the physical doors, just the locking and unlocking mechanism. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. The door itself remains on the high school, the elementary school. There's so they're talking about new doors, new doors, those doors. doors. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'll save a little bit of money, though, right? Right. Yeah. Yes. Are they doors that need to be fobbed? I mean, it's a long distance than that fobbed door. Part of it, part of it's uh, I'm tied to the alarm system. So every exterior door would be yeah. alarm. Okay. Whether it has a fob or not, it's going to be fob. Yeah. Right. Got it. Well, then they'll be monitored, yeah. which is really yeah. the key. And we know who's in and out. Yep. And we do, like me and my maintenance guys, we, we do use them doors a lot, you know, in and out. So, um, Painting. Um, we have a couple little projects uh, in the cafeteria or in the elementary kitchen. Uh, some ceilings that need to be painted and a bathroom, a staff bathroom we're going to paint this year. Um, and anything else we see that, you know, might need, might need some attention. Uh, water line replacement in the elementary classroom. We had an issue uh, this year. Uh, one of the classrooms was only getting hot water. So over, I think it was uh, Easter break or whatever, we ripped the lines apart and we couldn't get any cold water. So today we actually cut the lines and found uh, um, some some blockage in it. So we cleaned it out and we're just repiping it. Uh, so that we, you know what I mean, uh, they have cold and hot water. Uh, Tech Ed Wing, I, um, those expansion joints down there, I contacted Cole, they have, uh, material that'll mat pretty closely match our, what, and I just gave them what the square footage is we need, so they're ordering that, so we'll get that taken care of. Um, landscaping, I, there's not a lot of landscaping, I mean, I, we'll see what the summer brings, but, I mean, I know last year we had whole township prisoners here, but, um, you know, we, we may be able to just do it ourselves this year because they did, they trimmed a lot back last year. Is so that we'll the flag finally covered up? Yeah. I'll just say, I think it looked really nice in the spring. I think you guys did a nice job keeping it squared away from the end of the school year. Some concrete. Uh, we had some sidewalks settled over the winter time and they're causing normally to be okay, but they're causing areas of like ice in the winter, like water's laying in them, ice in the winter. And it's just a couple, I want to say four by four pads that need to be jackhammered out and um, done. And then the baseball dugout, it was never finished. When we had the new fencing put up, there's probably like a four foot by 20 foot the size of the dugout concrete that was never poured in there. And the bus farm floor, and guys have been, um, they have a crack in their floor and in the winter time they get a lot of cold there. So that's probably like a four by four area. So I want to get them all cut out and get them all ready. That way when I order concrete, I only order one truck and get them done. So, um, stadium fencing, um, everything's ordered. Uh, so when that comes in, they'll, they'll get that project going. And then any other thing we see as we go along in the summertime that needs to be done? The sign out front, some of the lights are burned out for a couple of weeks. Yeah, so we're having some problems with that. Uh, we're investing. Let me jump in, Mr. Becker. Please, because uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> you're so this company, this is a this is a sign from the billing project, and the company uh, is in California now. And so I've been in contact with them, and they've given us some troubleshooting steps to go through. We started one step. Uh, during school last week determined that it was kind of maybe what the next step might be 
The next step just kind of entails powering the whole thing off and switching some components out. And due to the rain and just being busy at the end of the year, we just didn't get to it yet. But that's that's on our agenda to get that done and try that. If that doesn't work, I'm not exactly sure what the next steps are. Yeah, so again, we'll, we're, we're going to try a couple things and then investigate where possibilities are. So you're going to turn it off, turn it back on. No, I already tried that, Mr. Majewski. That didn't work. I was hoping that was going to do it. No, there's the company is telling us that there's some components in the bottom of it that we got to go searching for, and they want us to switch it from the side that works to the side that doesn't work and then get back to them. I, I'm not quite sure how deep we're getting in there, but we're going to give it a shot. Hammer and a nail gun. Or have a poster board on the top there. <laughs> So that's all I have. Okay, next thing, solar update. Uh, we have a, a little bit of a solar update. Chris and I were involved with a meeting for for a week uh, this morning. Um, they will be on campus at our meeting next week um, to review the solar analysis. I wanted to put it in your hands so you could look at the numbers. They're very similar to numbers that came months ago. Um, we did get some some of our hurdles that we were looking to do, working through them. Um, so there'll be some discussion next week regarding their presentation and then after that to see where we want to go. Um, so we'll probably be looking at um, some type of movement on this in July. And I did say um, it's about a, what do you say, a 50 to 52 50 to 55 week. Yeah. Um, for PP announced a turnover. Yeah, turnover. So, and, and just knowing uh, what Central Columbia's was, it was about a year before they put shovel on the ground until they turned it on. Uh, are they connected yet? Yes. Oh, yeah, they are on. They, they, they are recent. Recent. Like in the last couple of weeks. Yes. Yes. Yeah. They went recent. online. So, fine. They've been waiting. Go. So, I'll, I'll give you time to digest this. And then uh, coming outside. if you have any questions during the week of something, if you're looking at this and something comes up and you want me to ask them, we can get them the question. They can come prepared with that answer to that question. Um, just so you can, you know, if, if you want to, I just wanted to share that with you, that information with you. I don't have the original presentation handy, but it looks like their PPA costs for the, you know, for the time that we're leasing it from them actually went up substantially. I thought that was close to 170 a year and it's over 200 now. Josh, I could pull that. I could probably dig in and pull that original presentation up. That way we can compare. I thought it was somewhat close. But yeah, I, let's pull that up. We'll get it to you. Okay, that's it for facilities. Anyone have any questions just regarding facilities? Okay, turn it over to Mr. Snyder for finance. Good evening. Um, so EIT discussion is our uh, first topic at hand, and I don't know how Mr. Hogan wants to handle this because we didn't talk in advance to see the agenda concept. But did you did you want to take over? Uh, yeah, that's fine. Okay. Uh, so I've complained several times over the past every time we're doing budgets about you know that if we did EIT only instead of property tax, we're going to be discussing raising taxes every year, blah, 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 because as people make more, we would get more revenue with about uh, the same percentage. When I came on, I was under the understanding that we were at the max EIT, one and a half percent, which is actually one of the laws says you can be half one or one and a half percent. Okay. So there was no option to just raise EIT and drop our property tax. Um, and doing some digging, um, I came to find out Act One was the state act that created the homestead farmstead exemption. What that act said was you can use EIT to offset property taxes up to 50% of the median tax value. Okay. So our median tax value, I want to say was, uh, was 40,000 or 35,000. I thought it was 32, but I'm going to pull it up. Maybe 32,000. So you could essentially offset 50% of 32,000 would come off everybody's property tax bill. Whatever those gross dollars are is the max that you can raise EIT. 
Okay. So they didn't want Ditrick saying, hey, we'll raise EIT and get two extra million and we'll only cut one million off property tax, right? They have to balance. Um, what's not clear is, does that wipe out the old limit of one and a half percent? We're already at one and a half percent. So uh, I asked Chris, he reached out to PASBO as a free source uh, to find out, do they know? Um, they think that, yeah, as long as you're balancing, you could go higher. Um, our next step would be to check with Carl. I didn't want to ask Chris or Jim to check with Carl and incur a bill before I talk to you guys and just see, do we want to consider it, right? Because if the majority of us don't even want to consider doing this offer, then there's, there's no point in spending the money. So <clears throat> to interject, our median assessed value at this moment for this budget coming up that you just approved is 30273 Now remember, that's not going to be $15,000. It's $15,000 of assessment. And you have to take that and multiply it by the millage. As an example, in Columbia County, $2,000 of homestead, farmstead is worth $115. So it's like, you know, 60 some, say just under $60 per thousand. So and I guess- Chris, yeah. I remember we're doing about 1,700 off out of that 30. Uh, current homestead currently homestead. it's 2,000, the two okay. zero, like 2,000 2, for Columbia and 1,700 for Northumberland, something like that. It's, it's not the same number because okay. of the millage. Yeah. Yes. So just taking 1850 divided by 30,000, we're knocking off about 6% right now. And the only other piece that's really important oh. from my point of view to discuss is that this only, it has to flow through Homestead, Farmstead. So if you have multiple parcels, you probably should only have one of them be your homestead and or homestead farmstead. So let's say you owned five parcels, only one or possibly one in you know, the farm would, yeah. would qualify for the discount. So the, the relief only flows through assessed value and only through homestead farmstead properties. What, what are we looking at for the, if we were able to do this? How much does EIT increase to do that? What what is the first what so what does EIT go from and to? I haven't gone there yet. So and, we, we and charge please remember that's one and the in the county charge is 0.5, so it's two percent EIT for the taxpayer. We get one point five of it and the county gets 0.5. Right. And then local municipalities do whatever on top of that. So it's super tight. Depending on where they are. Yeah. So so over one point five million dollars. Yeah. Yeah. And that would be the question. That that would be my mm -hmm. question. And this would require a referendum, is my understanding. So we would not be able to pass it till next May. So the, the two questions are, act one, when you change, make a change from property tax to EIT required a referendum. I believe we did that when we set up the Homestead Farmstead. So question one is, can you adjust it, or is that a one and done? Question two, does act one and we rule the one and a half? Can, can we exceed one and a half percent? Right. So oh, I have the discussion. If it has to go to referendum, it'll never pass. So why, why waste the time? I mean, I mean it might if, if, I mean, because you're reducing property taxes. It, that's why I'm asking how much does EIT yeah. increase, right? So it, it possibly could pass. I'm not arguing for or against it because I, I have no idea where, where this shakes out, right? Like right. They, to offset that amount of property tax, what are we looking at for increasing EIT? Because I have no idea what we can collect. Um, EIT yeah. is uh, this year you budgeted about four million. Four million from one and a half percent. What I've looked at in the past, we would need to take EIT from about one and a half percent to about six percent to wipe out property tax. We can't wipe out property tax with this. We could only wipe out half the median value. Okay. So for some people, that might take their property tax bill to zero. A commercial property. It wouldn't give them any exemption because they don't get a harm, homestead farmstead exemption. If you have multiple properties, you're only going to get it on your house, right? So there are people that would potentially lose in this because they may end up paying more EIT without getting reduction. Um, my whole reason for even looking at it, I think property tax is one of the worst taxes ever invented. You retire, you sit at home, you have your house paid off, and you just keep paying because you have something that if you sold it, 
you'd be homeless, of course. But if you sold it, it's worth something. I mean, that's insanity. Right. So I think it's just an inherently fair way to, have, well, one nice little flat tax, not graduated, but do it as an EIT. And that's my personal push for it. Am I, so am I thinking of this correctly? So if we're saying we currently collect about $4 million a year on 1.5%, that means the wage base that we're taxing is two hundred and sixty-six million six hundred and sixty-six thousand. Is that approximately? Southern Columbia's right? average median household income is seventy-three thousand dollars per household. Okay. So you look so at the size. It's two hundred and sixty-six mm -hmm. million. Is is yeah, the right? Yeah. Now remember that means that you live here, no matter what you work, either here or so wherever you work doesn't matter. It's where you live. Right. You can yeah. work wherever. Mm -hmm. And the EIT comes here. Like my EIT, unfortunately, goes to Sales Grove. Unfortunately. <laughs> so I know. I know. Work. <laughs> So, a, a, so to go to 2% on EIT on that same wage base raises about $1.3 million of additional tax EIT yeah. revenue. What, what would we be able to offset property tax? What is half of? So 30,000, you'd have to divide it by two, you come up with 15,000 and we're already giving away 2,000. So I believe you only have a $13,000 assessed value headroom. Is what right. I believe. Right. Which is so thirteen thousand times what? So the millage right now in Columbia County, yeah, I always I can't move the decimal in my head. I apologize. It's going to be uh the twenty three, twenty four it's fifty four point two. So fifty four point two divided by one thousand. So if you take that amount and multiply it by point zero five two four. Point zero five two four. Yep. So six hundred and eighty-one dollars plus the current one fifteen. So six eighty-one. So six, so it's about eight hundred dollars. Okay. So, so if your tax bill was eight hundred dollars, you would then pay right, no so, tax. So we would reduce the average. We said, or did you say median? What did you say? Well, so it's the, the median value. You can go half the median value. Half the median value. So the yep. median, the median property tax payer, or the median. They call it assessed value homestead. It's going to reduce by 800 for your farmstead or homestead only. Or both. How many, what do I multiply 800 by? Sure, so there are currently, the number of homestead, can... farmstead properties in Columbia County is 1890. 18, so and 800 then, times 1890. Well, so that's 1.5. Have... So it's about a half percent to get to, so that's, I'm just trying to see what the trade-off would be. Sure. There are 1,300 properties in the Thumberland too. Oh, so. So 1890 plus 1300 is uh, 3190. 3190. Mm -hmm. right, that's oops, 800 times 3190. 2.5. Okay. So 2.5 million on 266 million 666,000. It was almost like all sixes, which is interesting. Um, that would be almost a that'd be 1%. So go from 1.5 to 2.5 on EIT. If, if we were to do the entire the entire amount that we could. We yeah, when, we I, when I spoke with Casco, they were saying we can exceed 1.5. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I didn't go there because if everybody came here and said, no, Josh, we like property taxes instead of EIT. Well, I don't know if I like property taxes or not until I know yeah. how much EIT has to up, go up for property tax to go down. Right. Right, so... That answers the question, though, because it's not a, it, it's an not entirely, a ten percent hike. It's a one percent hike. One percentage point. It's actually a so, so to go to two point five from one point five, is actually a, it's a sixty seven percent increase in EIT. Yeah. So you're raising EIT by sixty seven percent. For everybody, like, there's no set of sixes for you. <laughs> so I guess where I look at is. I'm pretty certain that myself, I will be a loser under this. Yeah, I will too. And no, uh, I can tell you, I know, I know a couple of people in the room that would be, they would pay more this way than the current model. Sure. That's not necessarily. Uh, no, but, but that's not everybody. My point is just that I think it's a fair way to, to do taxes, and it's one of the few things we actually get control. So why, I, why I is it unfair? Right. So, you know, you could be a billionaire and rent a cheap apartment, live on ramen noodles, and you will pay pretty much nothing to the school system because your approval, approval is good. But if we're collected from EIT, you would pay the same percent as 
the person who has a house with three kids. Right? Is the EIT is a, a more progressive approach is what you're saying? Well, I hate that word. But that's what it is. Yeah. Progressive tax. So it's the more you earn, more fair tax. More you more you, well, the same percent, right? It's not a... No, the more you earn, but the more you earn, the more... You, yeah, I get yeah. that. Yeah. But when we say progressive income yeah, tax, yeah. there's usually tiers, right? Yeah. So it's not tiers. It's everybody pay the same flat tax, but flat that's tax. more you earn. It's not a flat tax. So you earn a lot, you're going to have more growth. Flat rate. Flat rate. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Right. Property tax is essentially a flat tax. Two people on the, the same value property, they pay the same thing. It doesn't matter how much they make or otherwise. So that's why I, I that's why I'm a farm out, right? I, I grew up on a farm for a long time. Yeah, and I mean, it didn't make sense. We paid some so, of the highest property taxes around despite not owning it because the thought was we could convert that to value. And of course, then there'd be no harm. And when we do that, people complain about that too, so. I can tell you that the past both suggest, oh, sorry, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. As they, they suggested that this was a difficult process. And my immediate response was just because it's difficult doesn't mean we don't do it. However, you know, those, I got to tell you that the two people I spoke with have 60 years of what I do, and I've got two, <laughs> and they were like, ah, been there, done that, failed. <laughs> what, um, so, because it didn't pass referendum. Can, can we get a historical look at EIT? I know it's available online somewhere. Do you have that readily available? Like, I can what, get it for how you. How has EIT, our EIT revenue evolved, right? Because that's, that's one of your arguments, right. I think, in, in favor of considering this would be, yeah. you know, okay, it's a one-time increase in EIT rate, but then it stays there. But as people earn more, we bring in more revenue without having to raise taxes. Okay. So the question is, you know, do we then, it, it keeps up with inflation to a certain extent as we, however, we, must be if it keeps up with inflation, do we have to then reduce it when it gets to be more than the 50%? Well, that would be a concern. Because you could hit your median we accepted value. That's value. Right, but is that, so that's the question there then. Is that, does this get changed each year or is it just that off, is it the balance in the year in which you enact it and then it is what it is? So then, the median assessed value changes every year and it can go up or down. So then your EIT rate Drew's correct that I don't, I guess we have to ask that question. What happens if, if perchance we I can't can imagine and, that is the case, especially if you have to have a referendum to change it. So earned income yeah. goes up. Yes. So if the median income goes down and earned income goes up, right. as well with inflation, right. it's going to make it very difficult to readjust it every year. Yeah. So my, I don't want to be in a position of readjusting every year. That'd be insanity. I can't imagine that is how. If right. this is possible, I can't imagine that is how it goes. I assume and it has to balance in the year in which you enact it, probably based on the previous year's numbers or some sort of projection for this the year so. in which you enact, and then it is what it is. But then the question would be, then what can we do with property tax the following year? So, right, right. So, so, so say we still have a, a shortfall that we actually need to raise taxes. Are we prohibited from doing so, or? I mean, is it or not? So I don't believe we ever, I, this is a question of do we need to agree to spend a few dollars with Carl. We need to look at it historically. So we passed Act 50 in about 1998. Act 50 is how we got rid of our nuisance taxes and went to um, the model we have now. And then Act 1 simply became an imposed by the government in 06. In my looking at our records, we never actually implemented Act 1 at our discretion. We only follow the government's requirements, which are, there's a there's a max cap for raised taxes plus an adjustment like this year we're at 5.2 percent. Um, so I still believe that the district could potentially engage in a full Act One model, but I don't know that because I'm not a solicitor and I haven't been able to obtain those files. And then and then if if this were to have to go to referendum to do this, the other question for Carl on that is okay. what is the district the board slash the district allowed to communicate to the voting public regarding the issue on the refer that is up for referendum because I believe we are fairly limited in advocating for or against. We cannot spend district monies to do either. Right. So so, have to be so this is something that is, sounds like it's going to be fairly complex to understand 
let alone explain and explain well enough when we're not even if we were allowed to talk about it or publicize the intricacies of it in order to inform the voters so if we can't reasonably communicate any of those things then it's definitely not worth our time to decide whether it's not even worth discussing whether or not it makes sense because even if we decided it was the greatest thing on earth to do i don't know how we would ever fund the campaign I mean, how we would ever convey that yeah I, effectively i like your thought process the question is the hoops and the, the regulations and, and all of that other stuff that's going to and, be involved and with it's it. different and it's different which is going to be difficult to pass right but we like things that are different i, I don't have a problem with different I, no i agree i do agree with you i grew up in family farm it's definitely and for people on a fixed income that you know still sit on their farm you know that is they rent it out or whatever i think it would be a, a benefit to those to those people and i think those are the people that would benefit the most who need to benefit the most on a fixed income however to get there and be able to get everyone else to agree i think tim's pretty well right with that i don't think you're going to get it to pass referendum yeah. that's the I, I would get back to what and I also think. Also, it's complicated, right? Even if it should, should pass, they're complicated, so people will be scared of it. Well, it's, it's complicated. complicated. You don't know if you're going to have to readjust this every single well, you year. Know, if we I could mean, explain that's what the benefits of it, it I think it yeah, I think if you could I explain it we, and state it, I think we'll, we won't be able to but articulate effectively. So, all I'm asking for tonight is can we ask all those questions? I say yes. Um, and we can, I guess, I think too, we can we can mold it, we can wait like we can digest this we don't have to make a decision tonight. sometimes i think we like we present something we run a decision in five minutes i'm okay if we let this you know saturate marinate whatever we want to ask them if, if anybody it. else did it like um so so dr schramm from pasco he did it in one district and took it from 1.2 to 1.7 and he said it was the fight of his life so they beat it all right so to answer that question yeah. about 1.5 right he there. was he went from 1.2 to 1.7 and he said it barely passed referendum and it created a lot of hard feelings against the district because in the end there were people that paid more and got no relief and they felt they, they were you know he used yeah, that will definitely district. be the case yeah. there will, there will be or the relief wasn't equal to the increase in the cost because your relief is based on property right tax. and then the other the other aspect of this is it's only one parcel correct gets the correct. reduction so say you own six adjacent parcels that are far, all individual farms, right. 200 acres a piece, you're now incentivized to combine them all sure. into one. Oh, it's not really, because once you get that initial median value, you're not going to get anything else anyway. Yep. It's not a percent of your assessed value, it's the reduction of ah, yes. it. Yes. But only off of one. Yep. Right. So as long as your one is above median value, I'm you'll get sure your, the same credit as everybody else. All yep. So, yeah, so, not so Mr. Majeski, one thing that's important. So let's. So how we do homestead farmstead now, right? If you have a parcel that is uh, median assessed, well, not median. Your parcel is assessed at say a thousand dollars in Columbia County. You pay no property tax because we give two thousand dollars value. And then what we have to do as the district is that difference, right? You have a thousand assessed value dollars left over, right? That's about sixty-five tax dollars. We then have to redistribute that to every other parcel. In Northumberland County, there's about 12 parcels that are below. They qualify for homestead farmstead and they're below. And in Columbia County, I'm going to say it's, it's low 30s. So those 40 properties, right? We have to retake that money and redistribute it. And then I know you know Excel super well. But then every once in a while, you have another property that with the new number actually is now above. So now you have to redistribute that $6. And it gets to be really just kind of a mathematical parachute you know it's recursive it's recursive thank you that's a great word and um, that's the, it that's the gives word. you all kinds of warnings when you open that <laughs> yeah parachute. it doesn't like it yeah so um so anyway so then if you if you add another layer there is truly a line on our real estate tax report line there's a line for this just just, just so you know and it's called portion of act one eat revenue used for tax relief for homestead exclusions 
um, to lower your real estate tax rate. And currently, and ever since we started this form 20 years ago, uh, it's zero, zero, zero. And then you have state property tax relief as the second line. That's what I call the gambling money. That's the, the tax on uh, casinos that gets the education and our current allotment is $373,000. And that's where we get the homestead farmstead money. The government from the casinos gives the school district 373,000. That's how we distribute out. So we start taking those properties, right? 1,900 in Columbia, 1,300 in Northumberland, add those up, divided by the amount of money, that's where you come up with our um, assessed value relief. Again, in Columbia County, it's 2,122 assessed value dollars. In Othermal County, it's 1,607. That's how you. Now, let's be clear here. An assessed, a property with an assessed value of $1,600 is a very, very, like it's, it's a piece of land probably with a, something very small on it. <laughs> you know, the, the median assessed value Mm -hmm. Of 32, what did you say? 30,270. 30, 30,000. Approximately what market value would that be? So there's the problem. You hit the nail on the head. So so STEB, market value. And then, so basically this number, it's a, it's a leapfrog number. So the STEB number changes every other year. And then the opposite is the real estate value. And that's simply a couple of real estate agents get together for the entire state and they set those numbers. They make them up every right. other year. They're all pretty accurate. Yeah, and then, and then <laughs> no, I don't agree. And then, so here's the problem. You can have big swings every other year in this number. And I think Drew said it correctly. If you had a swing where they took us down, I'm not saying you'd come up against a wall, but like it would be an interesting question. What would happen? Um, and of course, right now, you know, not only are we doing really well locally as a uh, $73,000 per household, you know, average income, which is 6,000 above the state average income for households. Uh, that's impressive, but then also property values. You know, we have been maintaining and slightly growing in property value, but that's not necessarily new development. It's simply homes that are improving themselves or a couple have been torn down and rebuilt uh, with, a, with a bigger home or a nicer, more value assessed home. So that's, um, I don't think that growth is going to maybe continue, uh, at least not at the levels it's been. Plus home values are up from the pandemic, right? People's homes are worth more, especially in rural communities, and you can work remotely. So we, we see it level up. And the only other thing Pasmo told me I think is really important to bring up is they said, even though right now, Southern Columbia is doing fantastically well on the concept of EIT and earned income. I mean, what Josh said there about the amount of uh, you know, EIT garnished wages, right? 260 some million, right? That, that's a lot of money if you think about it. Yeah, I didn't want to do all the sixes. Um, what if we had a major downturn in our in our folks' wages? That would then immediately impact our EIT collections. It would be more of a swing than property value, right? Most likely. And the only other thing is, the final piece, and this is just important to note is, if we did this, referendum in May, approved, budget, new numbers, right? From July to October, that three month window, where we normally collect the bulk of our revenue through taxes. That's what we would not collect that money, that couple million dollars. We would collect it over the course of 12 months. Because don't forget EIT is something that gets taken from every paycheck. So it's Are you online? Yes, it was you. Oh, me. cool. It was me, me to me. Hello, me. Um, I feel like I'm Dr. Seuss. Thank you, Josh. So anyway, the uh, concept there, I guess I don't usually hear myself. The concept there is um, you would have a delay in revenue. Not a problem necessarily, but we want to plan for a delay. If, if we did this, we would need to make sure that we'd have a sub plan for a delay in revenue. I'm used to, and I think you know most business managers are used to, by the end of August, beginning of September, you're getting a good influx of real estate cash the money that we would put through this program, if possible, if decided, if approved, would be delayed. The first year, obviously following it would be something to think about. So I know this sounds amazing and everybody's like, wow, this is super <laughs> easy. Why not, Josh? Why did we even discuss this? Should do investigating this. But I mean, I don't know. But a lot of those reasons they're like they're they're complicated, right? Like what if everybody dropped ten percent in, in wages? Well, I, I actually looked at it as a reason why we should do it, right? 
because we're going to sit here and say, hey, you got 10% less, now pay us the same amount as last year, plus 3%. Or, hey, if our whole community drops away to 10%, then we're going to drop in 10% and live like they do. Um, so things like that don't bother me. There, there's complications. If we can't say anything to explain it, we're going to waste a lot of time and just be frustrated by the process. So I don't know how that would even work for us to be a, in the position of wanting to pass it and not be able to speak to it, but that could well be the case. I just, I don't, I don't know. Carl is going to be here. He's going to have the, the answers. I just, I, I was I, told I, by Pat. If called any clouds, he'd oh. probably have that answer. Or he'll find it. I don't know. I just, uh, I like the idea of it. I just I think it would make our, I think it would make our budget more interesting because you take a 10% drop in, in, in EIT uh, over the course of the year because you don't know what it's going to be until after the year's up. So our budget is going to have to look at that as well. And that's challenging when they can't do anything with our contracts. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That means, so, that means you take a 10% hit on what, 24 million? Well, I'm thinking we're talking probably, uh, in this case, we were looking at six or seven million, so it'd be 700,000. So 700, I think that's what we were looking at, four million now plus 700K. Something uh, like that, you know. 700K would hurt. That would hurt, <laughs> big time. And we wouldn't know it until the following July. I, I mean, there's all those step back. You're arguing this on a somewhat philosophical level that, that's true. that that taxing income makes more sense than taxing property. And I don't know, I'd have to give more thought to that because I, I think taxing income is actually the stupidest thing that we do because income generally is tied to productive things that people do productively for society to some extent, right? That would at least be the idea that you're rewarded which pay for doing valuable work. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, why do we tax the thing that we want people to do more of? Um, but I don't actually know that, I don't know how I would argue that either way. And that's why I don't wanna have to have you think about it at the moment if we don't think that we could do anything from a procedural standpoint. Is it even worth unpacking that in this forum if we don't think we could actually proceed with whatever we then decided was the right answer. Does, does that make sense? Yes. There, is, there are appropriate places for those discussions. I just don't know that. Yeah, I think that's the question is getting clarification on if this becomes a referendum item, what can and can you not do? Carl could answer that. To sure. explain your position. That would be it. Because okay. Because you can't really break it down for the yeah, Okay. Yeah. Like beyond the layman's terms to get them past that you're saying you're going to increase something and they black out. Um, it's dead in the water. And then the other key data point is what has our EIT collection done on your historical review? You know, we talked about time so I just get, I, doubt it's ever taken a big drop, but you wouldn't know month to month when your October collections is something less than the prior October, that, hey, we might be seeing a trend to now. The breeze point, we may not be able to do a darn thing yeah. about it because contracts. Well, it's, we actually receive EIT uh, payments twice a week. Um, I mean, they're literally like eight to 10 times a month, but they're very, you know, they're 20,000, 30,000, 40,000. Yeah. But, but it is, we, we have cash flow every week from the EIT, every week of the year. I appreciate every week when I see the EIT deposits come in because it's like, yep, there's 80 grand, there's 50 grand. So, but what you're right though, it would, be t it would I don't know that that gives me a good EIT, flow. EIT is we levied on what types of income? So corporate profits, which would be typically filed, you know, either 41, or or 10-1, depending on your corporate structure as Corp C Corp. Um, and those are net profits. And then of course, just, standard gross wages and most interest rate and right. the very little is excluded. What about like social security? Um, um, so federal social security, I do not believe would be EIT, no. And, okay. yeah. and I do not un believe. Unemployment. If I'm so unemployment, unemployment, no, I don't think, I don't think so. Okay. I just wanna make sure that we're all on yeah. the same page. I don't think, uh, what pensions, ten pensions, will be pensions, I don't believe would be considered income, no. 
not not in the not in EIT guides. Uh, state pensions are federally taxed, though. So it's, it's specifically taxing income related to work earned, right? Right. In some sense, right? which is comes back to the. I don't know if that's the right thing to do. I don't you know, know. Mr. Majestic, I, I am opposed to taxes in general. I think taxes are, you know, right? but they're necessary in order for us to fund the school since we don't have an endowment. That's how, not how the public school system is set up. <laughs> so I will find out the answers. Uh, first of all, just to recap so far, McClure prior PPA rates uh, from before, we're going to get you that information. And I'm going to work the very minimal cost here to get some answers. Historical review of EIT. I don't even think we need the solicitor for that. I think we can do that ourselves. And uh, B, uh, options for communications in referendum processes for any type of referendum, not just this. I think that's worth it for us to know. Yeah, it's worth it for us to know. Yes. Uh, okay. Thank you very much for that. Um, contract discussion. So I would like to propose to the school board that we add additional language to the Act 93 contract, the non-union support contract, and the supervisory contracts, which are, uh, you just renewed, so I apologize. I, I, I wish I'd thought of this before, but I didn't. It came up because of um, some personnel uh, comings and goings. And um, this is the language that I would like to propose. And we can modify this. Uh, let me know. Vacation and personal days shall be prorated in the event the employee is not employed within the district for the duration of the entire fiscal year. How, that's, the, that's what I wanted. Right? That's, that's it. Not sure. But then I thought to myself, hmm, what if we need a candidate? What if we really want somebody and they have a request? Because that's actually when I got a manager, I had a request. And, and it was actually... No problem, right? The board reserves the right to negotiate vacation and personal day benefits upon initial employment. So if it's, you know, January and somebody's joining and they say, you know, we really want that candidate and we agreed on wages and sick times automatic and et cetera, and they say, well, you know, I really need 18 uh, vacation days. I need them. And we would typically, in a prorated model, give them 10. So the board could say, sure. Right but now? Right now, when you're an administrator and you get hired, like I got hired in August. Well, I got, I got started in August, so my pay was prorated. My sick days were not, my personal days were not, and my vacation days were not. That was actually my ask, if you remember. I wanted 20 vacation days. You guys said, yep, we just gave everybody 20 vacation days in these contracts. Not everybody, but these contracts. And I said to myself, wow, like where I'm coming from, just so you know, that's awesome. Because that's not how it works other places. Now that I've been here a little while, I'm like, now wait a second. If I started in January and I leave you in June, <laughs> I got 20 vacation days. You could have used all 20, but the on the other hand, you could use all 20 of those vacation days to, and not tell anybody you're leaving in June. And what can we do about it? So your final pay, we would we would reduce your final pay. And actually, I've actually I've gone after several employees for healthcare related reasons. Uh, you owe us, I hate to say this, but like 200 bucks. It depends on the circumstance, but we typically go after fair benefits. So this is a to me vacation personal is a benefit. It's not pay. It's it's a you know it's a fringe in my mind. So this is what I would like to do. And I mean you might have figured out where this came from. And I'm not trying to put anybody under the bus here. But like as a business manager, and I, I believe Jim feels the same. I just think like if you're going to join us, we're we're committing to you, right? But then if you're going to leave us early or before we think, then that commitment's ending, right? Like I don't think I owe you anything anymore because it was your choice to leave. Is that, I mean, yeah, I think I think it's fair, and we're, the other places I've been, this is actually even still nicer, just so you know. Yeah, all right, that's what I did in my own person. It's granted, but not earned. Yeah, so if you, if you came in April and you left in June, you don't get 20 days. But on July 1, you stay, you get 20 days. I apologize I missed this. We're having an executive session after sure. all this for personnel. It can also be for negotiations. Okay. okay, of course, because we need to talk about how you're going to amend these contracts. That well, we I figure we start well, small. These are just agreements. These, no, I that's what I mean. these are easy. These, are easy. these agreements, there's no problem. These are these are employment agreements. Yeah. They don't have any negotiation so, rights. It's the teachers. Yeah. The future. Future. So this is not. Yeah, you're just saying Act 93 only. Not union, 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 supervisory. So you guys have full discretion. discretion. I'm sorry. I, I was. Like Jim's not on the right button, but it's okay. okay. <laughs> no teachers. No use. Yeah, the we can't. Oh, yeah. Probably should say it. In that case, never mind. Yeah. 
right? That's true. I, I was just trying to understand how you thought you were going to just change the teacher's contract and that we weren't going to have to give Teachers away, don't get vacations. You know. So, well, they do. They don't. Definitely in the future when we have to ask me. I understand. Contract, I think we need okay. to look at this and how, uh, again, how we uh, distribute yeah. days. Yes. I Six days. I, yeah. Yeah. I think Tom, yeah. and I have talked about this for a while. We think they, you know, should be prorated. Somebody comes in, yeah. Yeah, in January. Yeah. Every question. No, no, it makes, it makes sense. It makes sense, across, across, the salary. makes sense across all staff and faculty, but it's yeah. impossible to just yeah. change the other contract. The only thing we currently prorate is salary, not fringe. I, I didn't understand it. So we're going right. to thank you. Sounds good. good. Yep. It's agreement, not a contract. Next one, yeah. phone system upgrade. So good news, bad news. Um, the good news is we have options. The bad news is they all cost money. So uh, the telephone system we have now, and Mr. Davis can chime in if he feels necessary when I screw up. Um, we have like an SV8100. Don't know what that means, but that's what we have. It's about 12 years old. Um, it does most of what we need. Voicemail is a bear, um, especially with setting up and tearing down mailboxes and those kind of things. The, the inter interface is very antiquated. Um, the biggest thing I want is 911 communication ability. We do currently have many 911 op options, and especially internally, our system works very well. Um, this conversation could certainly be also executive session for security and safety, but the concept of the discussion is we would like to consider an upgrade, and it would cost $27,000, which sounds like a lot of money. Uh, it is a lot of money. However, this would, it's a 12-year-old system, and it would give us a whole new interface and several options we currently do not have that would certainly work with our, new, our more modern security lockdown um, focus on internal and external communication. So and this came actually through the police officers to me. Um, there was a problem on campus, and one of them was not alerted to the problem. And we started trying to dig in and figure out, well, how could that person be alerted? And um, the answer is the system we have now won't do it. So then I said, well, I need options for something that will meet our needs, just like the speaker system we talked about and, and other communication devices, right? And we know that cell phones don't always work in our buildings, or at least in the bowels of our buildings. Radios are good for us on campus, maybe not to the buses per se. The buses are still, you know, there's a little bit of a delay sometimes. But this this is an option. So, Mr. Davis, did you have anything to add to my general gist? So, as Chris said, this this system is old. It is, I guess the exam. I guess I'll give an example. Voicemail. If new people are coming in, uh, new people are going out, we have to change voicemail around. Uh, we've found, you know, just finding extensions. There's no clear way on figuring out mailboxes. Uh, sometimes we had to add like a hundred to the number. Sometimes we had to subtract 200. It's it's very kind of complex. When Chris and I met with uh, Guyette and they promised me that this system would be, the interface would be more up to date, more easier to use, more clearer understanding to use. Uh, I, I'm in on that because it, it's not the easiest thing to manage. This system also allows us to kind of continue hybrid where you know we can still if we wanted to go purchase an IP phone and we had a network jack available, we could plug in an IP phone if we want to expand. I actually just did that this past week for a pre-K counts program over in the elementary. So we still have that ability with not having to gut the whole system but kind of to move on. Thank you, Mr. Davis. That's exactly what I was trying to say. So uh, we can come up with this again later if you'd like. I mean it's it's obviously one thing I asked them is if we decided to go forward with this, what's the turnaround time? Because we're still waiting on some parts from China, no lie, and we've been waiting like nine months for a different project. I, or maybe it's longer now, Mr. Davis, but they told me these are, are running at like five, six weeks to get in. And they also said it's literally, they walk down to a unit, sad truth is they pull two cards out and they push two cards in and, and you're upgraded. And I was like, how is that $27,000? But there's also some programming, because one of the things I want is the 911 metadata. So then from any phone inside of our school system, when you make a call to 911, internally, externally, and however we choose, the entire data packet goes. So it tells us high school, second floor, classroom 102, boom. And right now, that does do that internally, but it does not do it externally. So it's nighttime, and we're not on campus. 
if it's um, if it's an, a crazy moment, maybe that data is lost. Not that data can't be lost. Um, so that's uh, kind of the new. And that's actually not law, by the way. You have to do that whenever you build a new building. We talked about obligations, requirements, bathrooms, different things, ADA. That is now anytime you build a new structure, you have to have the metadata uh, included on all phones, communication systems. We're grandfathered in. That's the other problem. If we actually want to make a change, we have to add that feature. It's just like the sound system at the stadium, which you guys you know, don't want me to bring up. But if we change that, you have to put in those earphone devices for the part of hearing. It's a law now. We're grandfathered in, but it, if we do any upgrades up there, we have to add in units. It's just a stinking okay, thing. Just work that in the next year's budget. A little late now. Okay. Well, so we do have the money available in capital projects. Um, we feel strongly about it. We've been funding capital projects up, but again, for me, I don't want to keep spending capital projects to zero. That's not the purpose of that fund. It's more of a savings fund. However, we keep identifying things that, that are very important, I believe, for the security and safety of our staff and students and community. Um, so Chris, the thing one thing if I yeah. could add real quick, uh, the other thing I think is it's really starting to come to light that we took advantage of, I believe, last summer, is we have, Guyette has now had the remote capability to, to troubleshoot and not send texts on site. Uh, we had an issue, Mr. Becker and Mr. Snyder noticed that our phone time was not the same as cell time and computer time. And Guyette was able to fix that quickly, remotely. So I, I believe as we start getting the system more current, some of these issues, and maybe it might help us down the road where Guyette does not have to physically be here on campus to fix issues we have. That saves us a service call. When they do that, they don't charge us the uh, the show up call. They only charge us for the labor remotely, which is pretty awesome, actually. We had, the board did approve that was a, a $3,000 server we bought and put in the high school. Um, it was specifically kind of focused on the bell system, but it has solved many other phone problems for us as well. So, yeah, Mr. Davis, that's a good point. This new system, the uh, 9100 system, is um, completely compatible with that device to allow them to remote in and fix it. Right now, they have to come on site to fix our phone system. Sometimes we pay more for the show up than we do for the actual work. That's, that costs us money because it, it does need repaired. So something for us to think about. We're not taking any action on it at this moment. I wanted to bring it to your attention. We can dialogue about it at another time. Um, just that's something I thought was important to discuss. And we have June invoices. Is there anything else for the on, on the phones? You mentioned. Oh yes, sorry. You mentioned cell phones often don't work in the bowels of the buildings. Well, I know if I go in the elementary uh, basement, my phone has no signal. Even on your you know first net. I don't have a first so, net. So we absolutely allow people if they fill out the, the form to get on our wireless network with their cell phone. Now, do all people do that? I don't believe so. Text messages, but I can't phone call. Just just in certain yeah. areas, like I, I can pick up a phone call right sitting right here, but I walk in the hallway there and lost it. It doesn't work that fantastically. Yeah, these, these buildings are definitely have some dead zones, uh, cell, cellular dead Wi-Fi zones. calling is not the end. And yeah, works just fine for me. Doesn't use it all the time. But that's the, the network that needs to be robust enough to handle that, the Wi-Fi network. I, I think it also depends on the type of phone, too. We've had more success with one brand as, than we have with others. Um, I, I guess my question would be, does it make sense to invest a little bit in cell phone repeaters? Well, we looked at that, Mr. Davis. I don't know if you remember, but the numbers were... Uh, not. I, I'm, not talking, I'm not talking go to whoever... Columbia County used for internet uh, to get cell phone repeaters. So right. I'm, I'm saying just you you can buy them and we can, Scott can install them. Okay. It's really off the shelf in the worst zones. Just put a antenna outside, pull a wire. Okay. Repeater goes inside. Let's let's let's, let's investigate this. Okay. Hundreds of dollars versus ten thousand dollars per unit. Um, they now they can't handle, you know, a thousand phones. Right, right. Pumping through it, but there shouldn't be anyone yeah. in the school trying. Like, it should be a, a small handful of cell phone used being used, especially in the elementary. I don't really have too many problems in this building. And again, remember, every every building I think Mr. Becker mentioned is does every room has a phone in it. Yeah, I'm. I guess I just need to understand more what we use the phones for and what the intention is here with. Spending twelve grand to upgrade oh, this phone network. Twenty seven. Twenty seven. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. 
Um, so the phone, the biggest part of the upgrade is the voicemail. What was twelve thousand dollars? Did we say something was twelve thousand dollars? Maybe that was just in my head. That's okay. <laughs> well, I, hey, if you want to believe it's twenty or twelve thousand, vote for it. <laughs> it's not twelve thousand. Um, the biggest thing there was uh, the not for me. The nine one one metadata is is very important. We do not send that now. It does not go. Yeah, I so that, I that was a big thing for me. Um, what happens well, when somebody early. What happens when somebody calls nine one one from their cell phone? Are they so, more likely to grab their cell phone, or are they more likely to grab the classroom phone? And where is their classroom phone in relation to where they shelter for lockdown? So those questions I don't know. Most most classroom phones are by the door. So by not the, sheltered by the door. Yeah. So nowhere yeah. near where they would be used in a lockdown kind of yeah. scenario. People, in, in that scenario, people will be using cell phones. Right. So and in that case, you're going to have a lot of cell phone traffic. Attempting to go out at once so then in, in a week, so then also with Peters, so the Peters would be more of yeah. valid. So, I think part of the conversation is if we're going to keep selling with hardwired phone connections, then do we need to switch to wireless handsets in all the classrooms so they can grab them to take them to where they're sheltering? Or do we need to make the cellular network more robust and switch to a voice system yeah. that is just an app on their cell phone yeah. for internal communications? Yeah. That, that is the just the what my direction of my question is, you know, what is okay. Well, so these are I'm, good not, I'm not opposed to upgrade in some manner. I just don't know that throwing more money into a system that is dying. I think. Right, like wired communication, wired voice communication is it only exists in buildings like this. Right. So why are we? Why do we want to invest? Money and new things that in three years we have another, it still isn't going to be capable of doing what we need it to do. Yeah, but I mean, most people keep their cell phones pretty close most of the time, so, especially when you're out, right? Yeah. So, I guess, did we want to ask him to sort of tell us what you want in a communication system to see is it feasible to replace with? Mobile devices. Yeah, I, I guess the real question is, what do we need from the, from whatever system we're using? Like, what is can can we define the use case here? And like, how do we actually envision using these phones? Because that has evolved dramatically since we were in school. There's still some communication back and forth from the office to the classroom. Like we have to grab a kid, or so there isn't that communication back and forth. And that and that's fine. Mm -hmm. but that, that, mm -hmm. Is it worth twenty-seven grand? No, yeah, I agree. Does it I just you know, we're, that communication back. I know when the classroom dials nine one nine one one on our black phones, which are in the offices, um, it'll come up showing where it is. But nine one one call never goes out. We have to then put it out. Um, usually, we go running and know where it's at. So uh, the big thing is, I think, with the safety and security, if there's an issue, we want to be able to know if someone hits 911, whatever we use, we want to know where it's at, you know. Um, so when they dial 911, it goes to 911. You don't have to, no one has to patch anybody through. No, not in a class, not on one of the hand phones. It doesn't, it doesn't go out. It goes it to, goes to, it goes to, Every, every black, black phone, phone, which goes out now on a black phone, if you hit nine one, if the secretary hits nine one, one, it'll go out. You actually have to dial eight nine nine, right? Eight to get an outside line, and then nine one, which is also in the new law. Yeah, that's not allowed anymore. Because yeah. how do you know that? Eight is our outside number. When I got here, it took me a couple of days to get used to that. <laughs> dial eight for an outside line. Hey, can the classrooms do the same? Can a classroom get an outside line? Yes, they can. Yeah, so they, so they can dial eight. They can dial eight nine one. I, I think, but I don't. I don't think it's ever gone out. It my my understanding. Is, Why don't we test? We'll we'll, 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 we'll uh, the communication center and give this yeah, a try. Call them and tell yeah. me when to do a test. Yeah, yeah. I would definitely. Right. I would definitely test that. I mean, that's something that they should that know one. that and need, needs to be. That should know that. Yeah. Yeah. We're in no, Definitely know that is the fire. Yes, like we're no fire. Somebody hits nine one. Yep. And well, where? And where? It does say where the call. You notify it. However, you're not at the desk. 
Right, that's part of our problem. We had somebody that was out and about. To, they weren't at a desk. It goes to all the yeah. black yeah, in the whole district. Oh, yeah. You, we need to look and see if there's if they can dial eight. Yep. And if We're, that is the case, it needs to be right above the phone. Every phone in eight nine one one. You're not wrong. Everything. You're not wrong. You're, well, so, so what if it happens outside of school hours, right? I go a step further and say, I hate that idea. It sucks, and they should be able to dial nine one one directly to the police. That is the, the new requirements of all new public buildings. That's so that's twenty seven thousand. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's the new order. Phone. That's the new store. Yeah. And order. again, the new phone system. I hate to tell you this. It's two rectangular cards. They look like uh, pop tarts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the the money's really in the program. Right? Right. It's updating. Exactly. It is you know the the labor, not the. Also on the licensing too, Chris. The I'm licensing. Yeah, you know, for all the ports or whatever. Yeah. Okay, well, wait, we can come back to this, but, or, sorry, is there something else? Uh, this, or I found the number, I just want to make everybody aware, because they're going to come in in a week from now. Their initial lease cost per year was 97000 It was now 199 201 203 205 207 It's double from the time we started talking about this. Okay. So. We want to make sure we, uh, so just to be fair, um, we, dish, we initially had PPA five-year, PPA 30-year, and to rebate to the district, rebate not to the district. So I want to make sure. You, I don't remember exactly, so we can vet that out too. That's after that. There you go. You're still. I'm sorry. Fix this regard. Yeah. That's what I was worried about. It's still, you should still make it back on solar. Yeah. yeah that's, it's what I said. It's double. It's double. 99 to 199. This is the new one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The old one so showed 97,000. Lease cost has uh, increased. increased. Yep. Uh, savings is the goal we have there. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. You should ask them if they want to revise yeah, their the spreadsheet because yep. the new the old one, one doesn't look as well. nice. As the new one costs money look, on the third year. It doesn't look like they should have done any of the work they've done already. That's what that looks like. Okay. There, there's no point in them coming and talk if that's the new number. Okay. Well, we will we will reach out and reconnect. We will meet with them no, again. No, we're using the 30 year one. It no longer. Yeah, I know. Mm -hmm. Where's the but the comparison for the five year one? They don't have one for uh, or, or did they did send us one? They sent us one over the five year, right? Um, I think I actually have that. Uh, there's the five year. Yeah, yeah, we, we have this. Here. There should be your five year one from yeah. McClure. Because we had, if we asked them to do it, that's why we ended up calling. So remember, the original, the ninety-seven thousand dollar one was when they kept the five hundred thousand dollar rebate. I know that was always passed through them. No, we initially they not in the very first presentation. Yeah, it wasn't. and then we Every, told them we wanted very to There should be yeah. a second presentation someplace on the book. So that Mr. Becker happen. and I will meet with them again, and uh, let's we'll rehash this out. We'll just say we want to see where the numbers were, the numbers are, why and why they changed. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 We will update you ASAP on that. Um, June invoices, let me know if you have any questions. Um, they're in there. Any That's, public comment, Mr. Dave? No, this is where you had to deal with it. Mrs. Majeski, there's no public comment. Real quick, Mr. Becker and Mr. Hoagland, do we want to discuss web page calendars? Well, I didn't know we needed to discuss it. No, just... Not on the agenda. All right. <laughs> Got the vote to add it to the agenda. All right, then there's no, Mrs. Majeski, there's no public comment. All right, I think we're all set then, Mr. Davis. Let us know when we're offline, Mr. Davis. <laughs>